next speaker is Piers Doherty. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and delighted to be speaking to you here, here this evening. And I want to start by acknowledging that we're meeting on Noongar land and pay my respects to their elders. And we'd like to, in Sinn Féin to send a message of solidarity to the Australian Aboriginal people, who are yet another people who've suffered the dire consequences of British colonialism. A, a people who are still very much in struggle today for equality, for self-determination and for land rights. And I'm very conscious as we speak here, as an Irish politician, that we had a very unfortunate tragedy in, in Australia in the last number of days and I would like to offer my condolences to the family of, of David Green who died on Friday morning after a horrific attack two weeks ago in St Kilda East. I think that every Irish community across Australia is, and indeed the Australian community is sympathising and our thoughts are with the family of David Green this, this week. I would like to thank the other speakers here who've, who've addressed uh, today's, today's conference and I think it's really important that there are such fine speakers that are willing to come and take time out of their own very busy schedules and, and to, to speak here on, a, on, a, on this theme of generation immigration. I'd like to thank Alana uh, McTiernan who I know has been a long term supporter of all the Sinn Féin visits that have happened here in Australia and Jim McKiernan, our MC, who has been a very strong and consistent supporter of Sinn Féin, uh, to Mike Buchan uh, of the CFM EU in, in, in Western Australia, who has been our strongest supporters in Australia for many years. And I, I must say that without the support of, of that union, my trip here wouldn't be possible. And I know that they played um, a, a huge part, a part in providing great support for the Easter commemoration event in Perth earlier on where they put up a commemorative plaque to 1916 so I'd like to thank them for that and Samantha as well a great activist involved in the local Irish community helping to provide such important assistance for new arrivals in Ireland and I had the opportunity to speak to the group while I was here and it's just uh, you know it's amazing that the you know the Irish how the Irish come together and, and are able there to to reach out and support other Irish who haven't you know got on as well as maybe they have uh, during their time in Australia. Uh, as I said, this, this, theme, this, this tour is, is themed generation immigration. And you know, you've seen the statistics on the, on, on the wee video clip earlier on, about 76,000 people who've left Ireland last year as a result of immigration. And, and I agree with the, Alana and the other speakers. Many people who've, who've come here, and people have been coming here for, for decades and for, for centuries, they have come for their own choice. They want to see another part of the country. They want to do a bit of touring before they return home and settle down. But that's not what's happening in the most cases in Ireland at this point in time. 76,000 people leaving Ireland every year is completely and utterly unnatural. 1,500 people decide to leave Ireland and immigrate. Not to go on holidays, but to immigrate. 200 people every week, 8 people every hour are immigrating and giving up in Ireland. And it's completely and utterly unnatural. It's a huge rise in the number of figures that we've seen during the period of Celtic Tiger and other periods when there wasn't boom in, in, in construction or when there wasn't a growing economy. And for the most people that I speak to, and for many people that I've spoken to in the short while that I've been in here in Australia, I've asked them the question, you know, why did you come? Where are you from? Why did you come? And some people are getting on great. And some people enjoy it, and they like the weather, all the, you know, the, the best, it's always the top of their list. But for many people, the same thing, the same comment was repeated time and time again, and it was, I had no choice. And that's the, different, that's the difference between a lot of uh, people who are coming to Australia today and people who came in previous times. In previous times, they had choices. They had a choice to stay at home and try and go and on and get an education or settle down and get a family or buy a house or whatever, or get a job. Now they don't have those choices. For many of the people that, I, that I've met, and I was astonished at the number of people that I've met here in Perth who had young families, children six years, seven years, eight years, nine years, ten years, who made really serious choices. And I can say this as a father of four, my oldest is six, but to make a choice of actually pulling your children out of school and travelling halfway around the world is a huge choice that you would have to make. But they have told me that it wasn't a choice that they had to make, it was the only choice that they have. And many people are here and I've spoken to them and their husbands are working away 
from home. They're here with the family here. They don't have any family support around them. Uh, the husbands are working away for two weeks on, back then for, 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 for a while uh, in Perth. And they're paying for a house that they know that they will never ever live on back in Ireland because they unfortunately were children of the boom. They bought, had to buy their house at the peak of the market because the banks and the politicians collaborated with the developers to bump up house prices to an astronomical level where people are sitting on mortgages of four and five hundred thousand euro. And as bad as it is trying to service those mortgages back home in Ireland, to be halfway around the world and know that you'll never probably set foot in that house ever again and still serving, servicing that mortgage is something that I'm sure plays with people's mind in a dreadful, dreadful way. There's no doubt that our country, Ireland, is changing and is changing rapidly in the last number of years. And some of it's for the better and some of it's for the worse. In the last number of years, we've seen massive developments in the island of Ireland around the peace process, where we've seen a situation of doom and gloom, of war, of three decades of war, and, and terrible injury and hurt caused on all sides, transformed into a situation where we have power sharing in the north, where Sinn Féin and the DUP, bitter opponents in the past, sit down as equals and deliver for the people that they represent. We have the DUP now who promised a number of years ago in their television broadcast and their election campaign to smash Sinn Féin. We have the DUP now as ministers in that executive planning healthcare, planning transport, planning uh, infrastructure, planning tourism on an all-Ireland basis. People from Donegal will know that in Donegal in a couple of years the DUP Minister for Health uh, is proposing to build a new cancer centre in Derry. But it's not a dairy centre, it's a, it's a North West Cancer Centre because it's been developed on an all-Ireland basis where people from Donegal, Fermanagh, Tyrone and Derry will be able to participate. And slowly but surely, the, the idea and the concept of a united Ireland and the benefits that a united Ireland will bring is something that our unionist brothers and sisters in the North are warming to. We've been able to trade change conflict into peacemaking, and Sinn Féin has been at the heartbeat of that. And despite that the, we know that there's many outstanding issues, <coughs> there's issues in relation to orange marches, and we've seen riots spill over onto the streets of the North again this week because of some contentious orange parades. There's issues in relation to the Bill of Rights for the Irish language. And I must say I was deeply impressed earlier on where I got an opportunity to visit a community centre here in Perth where 50 young kids were learning Irish absolutely amazing and is a tribute to the teachers, to the organisation Irish Families in Perth and to the children and parents that they're actually given their children that gift halfway around the world. But there are outstanding issues and there's issues in, in terms of the legacy of the conflict and getting to the truth of what happened during those terrible years of war and Sinn Féin are very much in favour of an international independent truth commission where we can really begin to heal the wounds of what happened during that time. But our motives and our ambitions remain the same as a party. We're a Republican party who want to see the reunification of our country, but not just about stitching the six counties into the 26 counties. We want to create a new Ireland where all of the people of Ireland can share that piece of territory in peace, where every child is cherished uh, equally as the proclamation of 1916 proclaimed in the steps of the GPO nearly 100 years ago said. And to do that, we need to transform society. And what we've seen in the 26 counties has been an absolute abuse, abuse of the spirit and values of the people who fought for Irish independence. The proclamation of 1916, the founding document which this state was built upon, which Ireland was built upon, which the free state got its independence from, has been torn to shreds by successive governments over the last number of years. Ireland in the 26 counties, and this is the, ter the terrible fact of it, has seen a country that has been gripped with austerity, a country that is placing its citizens under a massive amount of pressure. As I got off the plane on Perth on Tuesday evening, there was about 50 severely disabled people, including people in wheelchairs, who were staging a 24-hour protest outside the Department of Health because the government had announced a new round of cutbacks which targeted the most disabled in Irish society and taking away their carers from them. 
And that's the reality, and I'm sure that many of the new Irish immigrants know it. People who have lost hope, who know that it's not going to come next week or next month or next year, the opportunity for me to get a job. But they know that what is coming down the line is more austerity, more hardship, more grief for me, my family, my friends. It's more taxes, it's water charges, it's stealth taxes, it's cuts in employment, it's, 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 it's more services being lost in your community. And throughout all of that, I think people back home have lost hope. And I see it in a lot of places where I go, that the heads go down, that people have lost hope. And I think that the worst thing that can ever happen to an individual is when that flame of hope is extinguished in somebody. And it was one of my first contributions in this term of the doll when I said to Enda Kenny when he was elected as Tisha, we had to agree or disagree to vote for him. Obviously I disagreed. But I got up and I said that despite the elections, and I would have loved it if Sinn Féin had been in government and we were able to implement our plan, our vision for Ireland. But that wasn't the will of the people. But I genuinely believe that the people last February in Ireland believed that there was going to be change. They had punished Fianna Fáil for putting bankers and speculators and developers above their interests. And now they voted for a different government which was going to supposedly put the people's interests first and foremost. And I said to Enda Kenny, I said, you're now Thysia, but I fear that what you've done in this election is dangle the flag of hope before the Irish people's eyes, and there's nothing more cruel than to snatch that from them. And I genuinely believe that that is what's happened. And we see that with the acceleration of people who are giving up hope in Ireland and are coming to Australia to find a better life and a better opportunity for themselves. We in Sinn Féin will continue to put up that fight. We will fight against governments handing over billions of euro to Irish banks instead of communities. 115,000 families haven't been able to pay their mortgage in Ireland for the last 100 days, and every single week that problem is getting worse. Unemployment, 450,000 people, and the young people, the majority of them are on long term unemployed now, can't get a job for the last year. And we see the spectre of immigration, 76,000 people, half the population of Donegal, every single year immigrating. And I was explaining earlier on to Australian friends what it actually meant in terms of financial stuff what it actually meant, the transfer of our money, of Irish people's money to the banks. 64 billion euro, 14,000 euro for every single Irish citizen was taken out of your pockets from the taxes that we paid and given to three financial institutions. 40% of the total value of our economy, and if that were to happen in Australia, what it would mean is 600 billion euro given to three banks at the same time where we're forcing thousands of people to emigrate and thousands more are lying on the dole queues. So my tour here is about a number of things. It's first of all engaging with the Irish diaspora. It's listening to some of the concerns that you have. It's trying to bring that home, trying to work with the trade unions here, trying to work with the local politicians here. And what I would love to see is trying to stem the flow of immigration back home because we can't have a country that continues to lose its brightest and its best. And the, the difference between immigration today and the immigration in the past are hugely, are hugely different. And we've heard it from Samantha, we've heard it from the trade unions. And there are issues that need to be addressed here in Australia. I, and it's even evident for me in the first few days that I've been here. The support networks for the Irish community are not developed enough. The voluntary groups that are here and the work that they are doing is absolutely tremendous. But the Irish government cannot wash their hands of the Irish community. They need to invest in the support networks in making sure that the Irish network and the Irish community <coughs> is a vibrant community and the safeguards are there for people who fall in hard times. We've heard from the trade unions in relation to the exploitation of Irish workers in terms of the 457 visas and those that are told to, get, uh, to, to go through the ABM process. And that's something that needs to be stamped out. And I encourage people in this theatre room and all Irish people who are thinking of going to Australia or people who've made this place their home, join a union. It is important, regardless if you're in Donegal or in Darwin, it is important if you're working to join a union, to stand up for workers' rights, to stand up for equality, and do not participate in a situation 
where you're trying to drive down wages of people in this country. We didn't tolerate it in Ireland when corrupt speculators tried to do that with immigrants that came in during the boom, and we should not participate in it here in Ireland. And we should be part of the fight back against those type of uh, developers and those type of businesses that are trying to exploit Irish people and other people for the sake of a quick buck. And putting your financial uh, viability in, in question. One of the things that we want to do here, and I'll finish on this here, one of the things we want to do is articulate the rights of Irish immigrants. I passionately believe that Irish immigrants, and I do this because I was born myself in, in Scotland, in Glasgow. My parents were forced, like many uh, from the west coast of Ireland, forced to emigrate uh, in, the, in the 1960s because of lack of opportunity. But I was born an Irish citizen. When my parents immigrated, they were still Irish citizens. You that are Irish are still Irish citizens, and you have rights, and you have rights and entitlements, because we were born in a republic. And when you're born in a republic, you become a citizen. And with citizenship comes rights. And one of the rights that you're still denied is the right to vote when you live abroad. And one of the things that we have done in Sinn Féin in the last number of weeks is to launch a petition demanding the right to vote for people, for Irish citizens abroad, whether they be in Melbourne, whether it be in Perth, whether it be in New York, or whether they be in London. And the bizarre thing about it is that indeed Irish citizens in Derry, in Strabane, in Newry, and in Belfast are also denied the same right to vote in presidential elections. So we'd encourage people here, and we're hoping that tens of thousands will sign this petition demanding of the Thesha the right to vote. It is something that's under consideration by the Irish Parliament at the minute. There is a body of 100 people that has been set up to look at this issue, to allow Irish citizens abroad the right to vote, but no Irish citizen abroad is actually on the panel. So this will be your opportunity to have a say in relation to being part of that. The last thing I want to say, and I, the reason I got into politics is because I'm a Republican, because I believe in the reunification of my country, because I believe my country is a great place, no better or no worse than any other country. But it's got its own uniqueness. It's got its own self uh, sense of purpose. It's got its own identity. And its people are great people. And we've left a, a legacy and a, and a mark in every country and every nation that we've visited throughout the world, and a very positive one. But our country is divided. Our country is still partitioned. And I have no doubt, as a young Irish Republic, Republican, that I will see a united Ireland within a very short period of time. Somebody asked me when I was over speaking uh, to Irish immigrants in America, and he says, when do you think we'll, see, we'll begin to see a united Ireland? I says, you're already seeing it. It's just you don't understand that you're seeing it, because we're living actually through it. A couple of years ago, the, what, what we're seeing in Ireland was completely unimaginable. All Ireland institutions, all Ireland policies, Ulster Unionist politicians, just a number of months ago, stood in this platform of me and Derry in front of in Derry City, um, in front of nine hundred people. Um, an Ulster Unionist politician, and Martin, and me, and him, and Mark McGuinness, and other yeah, people from the community, lad, addressing uh, nine hundred people Oscar, as to what we want to see um, a United Ireland look like. And you, Obviously, he didn't want a United Ireland, but he believed that it was a possible uh, eventuality, and that is something that is happening on the, on the QT behind closed doors behind the cameras, and some things like in those events, right out in front of the public, in your face. A United Ireland is happening. The question we have to ask is what shape that we want that United, the United Ireland to be. But I, the Irish diaspora throughout the world, throughout history, has always played a role in bringing about a United Ireland. In the past, during armed struggle, it usually was about raising money and shipping guns to the Athenians back in Ireland so that they would wage the war. Thankfully today we're in peaceful and there's a democratic solution and a democratic way forward to bring about a united Ireland. The Good Friday Agreement for the first time allowed for a border poll to be taken where if the majority of people in the north and south agree to united Ireland then that is what the British government and Irish government will do. Sinn Féin are calling on the British government to start that poll and to have that poll without delay. In every seven years until the answer is positive that poll will then have to take place automatically. But what we want you to do, what we want the Irish diaspora to do, is to campaign for United Ireland. And people might say, how, could, how do I do that in Perth? How do I do that in Australia? What does it really mean to me, or why should I do it? 
Well, you can do it in a couple of ways. One of the things that we've done, and we've done it very successful in America, we've done it successfully in Canada and in England, is we're asking organisations, like your, 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 your Irish group, your local GA club, your trade union, uh, any organisation, your local council, lobby them to pass a resolution supporting Irish unity <coughs> through the infrastructure of the Good Friday Agreement. A resolution that's been passed, the same resolution that's been passed right throughout the world. We're asking people here to start preparing for 1916, the anniversary of 1916, four years away. To start thinking about how you're going to celebrate that as an Irish person. These are people who went out and took on the biggest empire in the world and faced them down in the streets of Collins Street, gave their life so that we could call ourselves Irish men and Irish women. And how are you going to celebrate their identity? And friends of Sinn Féin here in Australia have started working with others to try and ensure that we have a fitting tribute right across Australia uh, for, the, for that event. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank you for coming. I'd like to say that regardless if you live in, in Dublin or Darwin, in Port Leash or Perth, that there's a role to play for the Irish here in Australia, that there's a role to play in terms of Irish unity, that there's a role to play in terms of being participants in Irish politics back home, and hopefully we'll be able to see a lot of you back home soon in better times. Thank you.